early on we made a prediction. We should be able to see that memory for trauma is related to the degree of betrayal. Now we can't go do an experiment on this. We have to observe the world and try to measure it carefully. And so our first um, approach was to look at childhood abuse perpetrated by a caregiver compared to by somebody else. And caregiver here is broadly defined. It's a, obviously a parent, but it can also be um, somebody that you are spending a lot of time with that you trust who might take you on a, um, a, a church overnight and be providing you with food and shelter. Um, and what we've, we um, found was um, that we uh, surveyed college students who had, um, and then we pulled out those who'd had some childhood sexual abuse, and we compared their memory over time depending on whether the perpetrator had been a, in a caregiver role or not. And sure enough, what we found was for both physical abuse and sexual abuse that when the caregiver, when the perpetrator was a caregiver, there was more forgetting, called here memory impairment, more forgetting than when it was essentially a stranger who had perpetrated that abuse. This fit um, well with our prediction and um, there's something like seven other data sets that have found a similar relationship. This led us then to ask the question, what about other symptoms of trauma? Could they be related to betrayal too? And we proceeded then for 20 years, essentially, to do studies where we said, what happens if we look at events and we pull apart elements of the events that terrorizing, elements that are high betrayal, and then look at the aftermath, look at people's functioning afterwards. And statistically, this allows us to, in some sense, control for terror and say, what does betrayal add to how people are doing after an event? And I'm going to summarize 20 years of research on this, because <laughs> I don't have 20 hours right now, to say betrayal is super toxic. Holding, to some, as, as much as we can statistically, holding, controlling for terror, betrayal is adding a lot of symptoms. So, depression, anxiety, dissociation, shame, and so on, including behaviors, problematic substance use. Um, sadly, the probability of being re-victimized. Um, so people are more likely to have an additional betrayal once they've had one. Um, and also physical problems, physical health problems. It's really, betrayal's really not good for people. It's funny because if you just read literature, and look at art, or think about life, you kind of know that, but in psychology, there's been betrayal blindness around the topic of betrayal. <laughs> what about gender? So, um, you know, I've, I've, in addition to teaching trauma, I've t taught psychology of gender for a long time and had um, a lot of awareness of some pretty standard gender differences, such as women being diagnosed with mental health issues at much higher rates. Um, and I, my students and I asked the question, is this exposure to betrayal part of why we're seeing such um, effects down the road for men versus women? And we began to do some studies looking at the relationship between um, exposure to different kinds of trauma and gender. Oops. So in the um, one study that I did with um, a very well-known personality psychologist and certainly not a gender specialist or feminist who um, I think was just shocked when he saw these results, but he's really good at measurement development, Luke Goldberg. We developed a measure of betrayal trauma that allowed us to ask people about their exposure to trauma, separating out traumas in different kinds. And we asked people about these exposures before age 18 and after age 18. And what you see here is, um, the, uh, our gender effects. Gender effects are marked by, are um, labeled here by probability. So um, probability is between zero and one, and zero means it's a very low probability that we would see a gender effect, and yet we did. Every time it's in bold and there's a bunch of asterisks, that's a gender effect that is super significant. Uh, the first thing that should pop out is that depending on the type of trauma, men have a bunch of more, and, and, or women have a bunch more. We're not walking around the world getting the same experience, which again is sort of like, duh, but this really marks it. Overall, men and women have about the same trauma rates. And so for years, people were just measuring overall trauma and saying there really wasn't a gender effect. 
there isn't at overall trauma rates. Where you get it is what kind of traumas. Another way to understand this is we divide these into high, medium, and low betrayal events. And we see that women report more of the, the, the trauma when it's high betrayal, never when it's low betrayal. Men report more of the trauma when it's low betrayal and never when it's high betrayal. <coughs> Another way to look at this is ask the question, what's the pro that this, this was a sample of homeowners, relatively privileged, but otherwise somewhat demographically diverse. Um, and their age on average was around fi in the 50s. Um, they ranged though up into the 80s. Um, and we asked the question, what's the probability these individuals had at least one traumatic experience? And these were major traumas. And we found that if we looked at men and women separately, um, first of all, we have a lot of trauma. The lowest rates of trauma here are still alarmingly high. But if we look at a, um, the rate of at least one traumatic event categorized high betrayal, women report over 50% over of our women have had at least one high betrayal trauma. And these are big traumas. Uh, if we look at at least one traumatic event categorized low betrayal, there's still traumas. These are things like car accidents and natural disasters and being attacked by a stranger. We find that men have had, over 60% of the men have had at least one of these experiences. And um, obviously everybody's got alarmingly high rates of exposure here. This, although this is from my data, this is not out of line with lots of other studies of trauma rates in general. Um, we, we get exposed to these things in, in our relatively privileged world. Is it culturally specific? We don't have all the answers to that. We have mostly North American samples. We do have one sample from the island of Kauai. Kauai, um, and, and this is a, a, a sample that um, includes mostly native Hawaiians and Japanese Hawaiians, um, and uh, Caucasians in the sample are in a small minority. And we find um, in this sample that we get two things. One, exactly the same gender effect. Men are reporting more low betrayal, and women are reporting more high betrayal. But we also have a whopping social status effect such that lower social status is associated with more trauma of all kinds. This fits with everything else I know from the literature. Um, being exposed to trauma is a risk factor that depends on your social location. We're not all equally likely to get exposed to trauma in general, and we're not all li equally likely to get exposed to some traumas, even though they're not zeros here. They're not zeros. No matter what your social location, you can get exposed to any of these traumas. It's all relative probabilities. So to summarize 20 years and add one more, it's really toxic to be betrayed and it's really gendered. Okay, I'm gonna switch now to institutional betrayal. Institutional betrayal is a concept that was lurking in my lab all along, but one that we didn't start researching in a systematic way until the year 2010, when a graduate student joined my lab named Carly Smith. She's now an ass assistant professor at Penn State. And Carly Smith was very determined to figure out how to measure institutional betrayal. And so we did a study together. We started with the question, sorry, I'm having a little trouble with this clicker, obviously not responding. Can you go back one thing? Back, yeah. We started with the question, can institutions be betrayers? And also, will we have blindness for institutional betrayal? When our government betrays us, might we not see it? Because we are all super dependent on our government. And just to ask yourself the question, what happens when we see it? It is really disruptive, right? It is really disruptive. Um, like individuals, institutions may be trusted and dependent upon, and furthermore, and this is the important thing, we have an attachment reaction to institutions. We have an emotional reaction. We love our institutions. I bet many of you in this room love your church, love your country, love the school you went to. That love reaction is part of the attachment system. It probably didn't evolve for great big institutions, but we are humans and we, we operate um, as if institutions in some sense are people. But, but institutions don't love us back. And you gotta think about that because, because it puts you at risk if you think they do. 
people can love you back. People in institutions can love you back. I promise you, institutions do not love you. Um, but they might betray you. They might betray you. And so we wondered if they did, would it be harmful? And also would people sometimes just not see it? So our first empirical focus, we actually wanted to do a study with military sexual trauma because in 2010 there was a lot of talk in the news about how being assaulted in the, in the military is bad, but reporting it was so much worse. Um, but the US military wasn't really so keen on giving us access to a sample. <laughs> And Carly had a first year project requirement with a firm deadline, so we turned to the institution we could easily work with, which was higher education. And I have to admit, I told Carly, well, it's, it'll be a first good study, but we're not gonna pick up a ton of institution betrayal because <laughs> colleges are such nice, warm, fuzzy places. <laughs> and um, yeah, I had heard stories, obviously. I knew it existed, and students had told me, but I figured it was relatively rare. Um, but it would be a good first study. So we, um, d first of all, defined institutional betrayal very broadly, institutions harming those dependent on the institution, but then we honed in on the failure to prevent or respond supportively to wrongdoings within the institution when there's reasonable expectation of protection. So that's what we honed in on. So the way we did our first study is we, we had three things we measured. We measured exposure to sexual assault. In this first study, it was lifetime exposure, but these were people on average about 19 years of age. We measured their trauma symptoms, symptoms highly associated with exposure to sexual assault, and we created a new measure, institutional betrayal questionnaire. That new measure was a checklist of experiences. We never asked people, were you betrayed? Just like we never asked people, were you raped? We give them behavioral experiences and say, did you have such an experience? You can't rely on people to, uh, to apply these labels to their own experience, especially if you have betrayal blindness, you're not gonna say you were betrayed. But you can get people to tell you about specific experiences they may have had. We found high rates of lifetime sexual assault in our college sample, this is not news. A gazillion other researchers had found it, even though the United States population doesn't seem to know, this is not news, or maybe now they do, but. I don't know. We also found trauma symptoms were related to sexual assault. Again, not news. What was new was that 40% of those reporting sexual assault did also indicate institutional betrayal. Now in this first study, the institutions could be anything that they wanted or had experienced. So it included schools, um, churches, Boy Scouts, but most of the institutions our students were reporting were actually college related, the vast majority, either the school itself, fraternity, sorority, um, college club, that kind of thing. Importantly, trauma symptoms were related to institutional betrayal, and here's how, what it looks like. It's a matter of exacerbating the harm. So if you look at the bottom of this, what you see is a, a measure of how much sexual assault somebody's been exposed to. From, from very low rates of sexual assault experience to very high rates of sexual assault experience. And then you have a symptom. I show anxiety here, but we see a similar pattern for other symptoms. And you see the more sexual assault, the more of that symptom you have. This is all probabilistic. It's not deterministic. Some person could have experienced a lot of sexual assault and not be anxious. But on average, the, uh, this is what we're seeing. Now, what we have here are two lines. One is for the people that had this experience in an institution but without institutional betrayal, and then we have the people that had one of these institutional betrayal experiences. And you can see they're experiencing more of the problematic symptom. So a way I understand this is that the institution is essentially adding harm over and above the interpersonal violation, which to me immediately says, we and in institutions need to change how we're doing our business because it might be hard to stop all the interpersonal violations, but goodness, we can stop and change how we're behaving as institutions, right? I don't have time to tell you how it went when I took all that to my university administration. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we've also um, seen that institutional betrayal is associated with physical health problems, um, even when controlling for the exposure to betrayal trauma. Again, above, over and above. I sometimes say to the university administrators, they're spending more money in, in our student health. <laughs> that sometimes gets their attention. 
Um, and a study that was um, done in a military context, although with veterans, so no longer active service members, and I was not um, one of the researchers on this study, but they um, took um, this, the institutional betrayal questionnaire and used it with some military sexual trauma survivors. And what they found was that those um, veterans who had been sexually traumatized with institutional betrayal as compared to sexually traumatized without institutional betrayal were suffering more PTSD symptoms, more depression, and then I think most alarmingly higher odds of attempting suicide. And to, we haven't measured this with our undergraduates, but to me, I, I'm pretty sure we'd find it. And to me, it says this is not just like suffering or using more resources. This is life and death for people in some situations. I also believe it's not good for institutions. Um, I, I, it's associated with illness, absenteeism, departures, resource uses. Dis we've measured disengagement from the system. And ultimately, there's going to be a reputational cost to the extent that we, we as a society say this is not acceptable, even though probably protecting the reputation is a lot of what leads institutions to behave in these problematic ways. All right, sexual violence and harassment on campus. We've done a lot of studies measuring <coughs> rates and I'm trying to understand where and how sexual violence is occurring. And I just want to tell you a few things we've learned that may, may generalize beyond just the college campus. First of all, sexual harassment and assault on campus is usually a betrayal trauma because it's usually occurring between people who know each other or in the same social network. Um, we know victimization risk is associated with gender and social inequality. It's frequently compounded by institutional betrayal, and we know there's many negative outcomes from this kind of victimization. Between 2010, when we collected the data, and 2013, when we published it, the United States had a, something of an awakening about um, campus sexual assault. There were activists who were pushing the issue. The media started to publish. There was a New York Times front page article in 2013 about campus sexual assault. And then the Obama administration did something no other administration has done, which has made it a sex, an aspect of sexual violence a national priority. And they created a task force in January of 2014. So it really became a topic. Um, and I think this helped fuel a lot, of m lot more activism on my own campus, the University of Oregon, in May of 2014, just a month after the first report from the Obama administration task force was released there was an allegation that came to light of um, a gang rape on campus. Now, they, this was, came to light in May, but it was um, an alleged gang rape from March. And the alleged perpetrators were members of the basketball team. And the basketball team had gone on to NCAA championships. And it just didn't look good that this information had been suppressed for two months. Um, and people were angry, and there was a lot of campus demonstration, and it was really a crisis on the campus. Um, I, by then, was well known to the administration and the media as a person who would speak about these issues. I was called into a meeting with the administration in a state of total crisis and panic, sat down with the university president and some others, and they were like, what can we do? And I said, well, we can do number one step. Um, run an anonymous survey so we can find out what's really going on around here. They said, okay. Then they looked at my survey and they said, no way. <laughs> um, but my lab and I thought, we're, you know, we need to do this survey because there's going to be a lot of institutional changes. We need data and we need to find out what's really going on. So we did the survey despite the administration over the summer. And we um, have actually now done a couple of surveys. It's been very interesting learning experience when <laughs> I just think of it as grist for the mill. <laughs> um, they actually did sort of retaliate against me to the, to the media, which wasn't cool. So when we do this research, um, we uh, see sexual violence um, to include a variety of behaviors um, that are basically uh, sexual or gender-based, including dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, and sexual harassment. And we know in, in, in that this impacts people of all ages, um, including university students. And we know, as I mentioned, it's associated with both gender and social inequality. I also want to take a moment to just point out what might be obvious to you, but sometimes gets lost, which is sexual violence is simultaneously a lot of different kinds of problems. 
Um, and I don't have listed here spiritual, but I should. Um, but it's a public health problem, it's an educational problem, it's a criminal justice problem, it's a human, human rights problem, and it's certainly a civil rights problem. Sometimes we get lost on just looking at it as one of these kinds of problems, and it really tends to steer us in the wrong direction when we do that. So I just want to also let you know that uh, I also put everything I possibly can on this research on my lab, the measurement instruments that I used. Um, are all available open access on my lab, as well as many of the findings. So we found the usual high rates of sexual assault victimization, but still it was really shocking to see the local data. People like to say the problem's out there and not here. All the time we do that. We all do that. Um, we found institutional betrayal happens, and we also found that graduate students show a different pattern, and I think this is an important pattern to come to, even though it's very specific to higher education, but I think it has some important lessons for a lot of other contexts. First of all, we found that that 40% pop up again in these studies of the amount of, the number of people who'd experienced institutional betrayal who had, of the people who had been sexually violated. When we took our findings to the university, it really had an impact on the campus. And so this really is to say, if you have the opportunity to do an anonymous survey in your local context, you should. And you should do it right, with the right kind of scientific approach and measurement, but then you should do it because it'll cut through a whole lot of denial. Just blast through denial, never mind giving you some specific information about where risks are higher. Um, it, our research team included quite a few people. Um, th these were the primary researchers from my laboratory. And um, I just want to give you a sense of the kind of rates we're seeing. Can you advance one? Um, so among undergraduate students um, from our second study in 2015, what you see are rates for different kinds of sexual um, violations, and on one side the male undergraduates, on one side the female undergraduates, and this is highlights how gendered this is. Um, wherever the, their asterisks, it has to do with, with statistical significant, the significance. These are all significant effects. We have 13%, and these are events in college that happened at our university, um, or field trips that's associated with the university. 13% um, of our female undergraduates had a completed rape experience as undergraduates, and goes all the way up to 27% when we include um, attempted sexual contact without, or completed without consent. Um, and there's also a lot of other negative experiences people are having. The amount of sexual harassment is whopping, whopping, that students are experiencing. <coughs> if we look at graduate students, so again, we see a, a higher risk of female students than male students. But we also have some, a really different pattern of where they're at risk. And I'm going to show you the next slide, just, just for our female students. And now, wh whether, when there's asterisks, it refers not to a gender difference, but a difference between males, I mean, between graduate students and undergraduates. And what I want to draw your highlight to is where do we see more of one kind than the other? For undergraduates is where we see the, the contact sexual assault rates being higher. It makes sense. Oh, part of this is about opportunity. They are living with other people. They are outside of a network that might be a safety net, essentially. Our graduate students tend much more likely to be li um, living, they might be married, living in a more, um, a more established relationship or with people of their choice. Um, where we see graduate students at risk, and this is what I really, why I'm showing you this slide, is they are at risk, particular risk, of being sexually harassed by faculty and staff. What does this tell you? First of all, most of the sexual harassment is all words. It's not, there's very little physical stuff. There's some, but it's mostly all words, behaviors and words. But it tells you something about power and opportunity. Graduate students are working closely with their supervisors, so there's more opportunity, but they're also much more dependent, and they have, the, the supervisors have a ton of power over them. And it doesn't really stop there, because then we can ask the question, what's the effect of this on people? And what we find with our graduate students is that controlling for all other forms of victimization, harassment by faculty and staff is associated with feeling unsafe, trauma symptoms, and experiences of additional institutional betrayal. 
Perhaps sexual harassment by faculty and staff is itself a kind of institutional betrayal because they represent the institution. And I would think, we haven't done this in the context of a church, but I would think these results were, would be likely to generalize to that context. Um, we've also asked about other kinds of uh, social location issues, not just gender. So one that we looked at is sexual orientation. We found that um, in, if we look at sexual assault for undergraduates, that um, being a non-straight male is, a, is an enormous risk factor. Gender still is a giant risk factor, but within our male population being non-straight almost doubles the risk of some sort of sexual assault and does not have that effect on female students. If we look at Could you advance one, please? If we look at institutional betrayal, we see now that um, the, the effect of not being not straight is enormously high for female students. This is institutional betrayal in the aftermath of a sexual assault. Um, and one more, please. And if we look at graduate students, and now um, ask about these, and if we can try, okay, that worked. Um, sexual harassment, here we see a pattern, um, again, that's different. So being a not straight woman is the highest risk fact category, and then straight woman, non straight man, straight man. And we see a similar pattern with institutional betrayal for um, sexual harassment. Uh, th this speaks to the intersectionality of these issues. It's complicated, but it also speaks to roles of power in our so and, and prejudice in our society. I am uh, sure we would find similar and interesting patterns with other dimensions of social inequality um, on our largely white campus. Um, it's really difficult for us to do statistically meaningful samples when we get into smaller groups, although we have 30% not white, there are many, many different groups with many, many different experiences and I can't lump them together, but I, I know from other people's research that being in a, in a different racial or ethnic group or um, even in, in our campus being in a different religious group from the, stand, from the mainstream will put people at risk. Okay. Um, I'm going to now talk about what we've learned about disclosures, um, uh, responding to disclosures. We have done many, um, many studies on disclosure. It's a really, really important issue because trauma is difficult to talk about. And um, it has an enormous impact, as Becky Williams um, mentioned, how people are responded to when they do talk about it. Without disclosure, prevention is hampered. It is really hard to stop ongoing trauma and abuse if you don't tell anybody. It's also hard to have any resources if you don't tell anybody. So we want people to be able to tell. However, non-disclosure is really, really common. It's more common than not. And this is because disclosure is risky. It can lead to a positive outcome, yes, but it can also lead to a negative outcome. Somebody who discloses can find themselves in a worse situation than just keeping their mouth shut. A bad response can make things worse for the vic victim. In fact, a bad response can be a new betrayal trauma. And from the institution, it can be an institutional betrayal. What are harmful responses? There's been quite a lot of research on this, um, not just by me, but by many of my colleagues. Among the harmful responses are not acknowledging minimizing, sometimes w with good intent, but still harmful, oh, that was so long ago, distracting the survivor, oh, what did you have for breakfast? Turning the discussion to the self, oh, yeah, if you think that's bad, let me tell you what happened to me. Taking away control for the s from the survivor, again, it can be well-intentioned, but harmful. He did that to you, I'm gonna go beat him up, or I'm gonna tell the police. Blaming telling them it's their fault, invalidating, no, that didn't really happen, punishing, obviously. And then something I, um, I'm gonna tell you about in a little bit called DARPO. Those are all harmful responses. I'm sure that's not an exhaustive list. We know that, people know that institutions are not always the best listeners. Of our sexually harassed graduate students, 6% had told anyone at the university, which means 94% had not told anyone at the university. 
Um, we also have data from undergraduates. If we look at our undergraduate population, 37% had some kind of trauma, and this includes a number of different kinds of trauma while a student. And we can ask, did they tell anybody? And what we find is that most of them didn't tell anyone um, of the, the ones who'd experienced something, but about a, about a quarter did tell somebody. And then we can say, well, who did they tell? They told their friends. They didn't tell official sources. They told their friends, and then maybe family members. Almost none of them told official sources. They told people they thought might have a good response. There is a good, uh, 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 there's some good news here. Um, and it, um, we did some research starting with a question, what can we do about well-intentioned but unskilled listening? So this is when people mean well but still have harmful responses. And uh, this includes invalidating, taking away control, turning the discussion to the self, distracting, and are failing to acknowledge. We asked the question, can we teach people how to be better listeners? And we did a study where we brought people into the lab, undergraduates with friends they'd been friends with for at least three months, and we had them, um, we randomized them into conditions where they learned some listening skills, and then we had them go through an, um, a process where they disclosed some um, disturbing event they had not previously told their friend, but could felt was an okay thing in the context of that relationship to tell their friend. And what we compared was some um, education on empathic listening and whether it made a difference on how those disclosures w went. And it was a one-page educational intervention, one page. It had uh, um, tips on attentive body language, verbal skills to encourage disclosure, and words that convey support. And this is all available on my website if you want to use it. And what we found is that did I get a take away this? Oh, okay, I left out the finding, <laughs> which is the education helped improve disclosures from both the victim and blind raider's perspective. So it went better. And you know, I think that th that intervention was both the specific skills and also reminding people implicitly that how you respond matters. I do want to say a little bit more about the issue of control because I know a lot of people grapple with their, their responsibility to pass on information they've received. And I want to urge you to be aware that sexual violence is fundamentally a violation of autonomy and control. And when somebody's been sexually violated and they have their story, that might be the only thing they have left that is theirs, that they control. So when they share their story with you, you need to respect their control and not run with that information. In fact, it just chills reporting if you do. It doesn't even actually accomplish anything, but it can really harm people in the meantime. There are policies all over this country that are called mandatory reporting policies, some at the state level and universities all over. They may have come from good intention, but, uh, but um, we've been doing research on this and it is not a good outcome. We need to give people support. Um, we need to give them time. We need to give them information, but they let them hold control. And we're going to end up getting more reports that way. Um, and we've, uh, I'm going to go past this, but we've also um, asked people about what they want. They all want, they, uh, all people who are survivors pretty much want to retain control. There's resources on this. I want to now talk a little bit about DARVO because I was talking about the situation where you have well-intentioned um, people making mistakes. In the case of DARVO, I don't think this is about being well-intentioned, alas. DARVO is a response that we um, see out there in the world. And DARVO stands for, um, it's an acronym, it stands for Deny, Attack, and Reverse Victim and Offender. And um, it's a response that the person being held accountable or that person's apologists may use to deflect blame, to confuse people, and not be accountable. So examples. Um, <laughs> none of this ever took place. You're a disgusting human being, and I'm a victim. These are actually words. I, I actually made this slide before the current hearings. Um, <laughs> but. Um, somebody super famous uttered these words. Yes. 
Um, so we've been, the DARVA is a concept I introduced in the 1990s, um, just based actually on ob but, um, observing the world. My own experience, watching the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas hearings, and observing the world. Um, and I was trying to make sense of something that seemed really confusing, especially this reverse victim and offender. It's really confusing. Those of you who are familiar with the concept of gaslighting, it is pure <laughs> gaslighting because you get really confused. Um, but more recently, we've been doing research on DARVO in my lab, and my primary collaborator is Sarah Harsey, a graduate student currently at the University of California, Santa Cruz, but she was at Oregon. And we have found that DARVO hangs together empirically. If somebody denies and attacks, they're also more likely to do this reverse victim and offender thing. Um, we, w we have found it's associated with victim self-blame. So people who are exposed to DARVO are more likely to blame themselves. This relates to this gaslighting element of it, but it's really, really dangerous because self-blame is known from other research to be associated with silence. So it is presumably a, a strategy to keep people silent. Um, we've also more recently used some um, vignette studies where we can experiment experimentally manipulate um, things. And we have found that if people, are, if our um, participants read a description of sexual, of uh, some kind of violation, followed by a DARVO response, as compared to the very same description followed by a non-DARVO response, that the people that read the DARVO response are more likely to hold the victim accountable, more likely to um, find the victim less credible, and blame the victim. Um, interestingly, there's a little bit of negativity towards the perpetrator too, as if DARVA's just kind of slimy across the board, but it's, a, it's hurting the victim more. Again, saying it's an, uh, it's an effective strategy. Our last study that, we, um, uh, that we've completed, we have others in, in progress, offers some hope, which is if you educate participants about DARVO, teach them the concept, they're not quite as affected by it when they read it. Um, so I've just been on this campaign, especially the last few weeks, of trying to teach people to recognize this um, and, and be aware of it. And you know, one of the things that's occurred to me, um, although I would have said before this, oh, you know, denials, you're gonna get denial whether somebody did something or didn't do something. Denials just, uh, everybody denies these accusations. It doesn't give you much information. I think we need to look at also the type of denial. Are they denying the specific act thing or are they denying the obvious? And how much is the denial over the top versus very specific to, to the situation? Um, but we can come back to that. All right, so I think in the meantime, I, you know, I ask you to call it out when you see it and educate others. And now I want to say, well, we can become better responders, both by our own response as well as calling out other people, and that will help. And I want to end with institutional courage, because I do think there are things we can do um, to address these problems. So I'm going to go through, um, go through 10 steps to institutional courage, one by one. So um, I'm going to flip through this, because I'm going to go through one by one. So at a minimum, we should comply with the laws that do exist and go beyond them, uh, go beyond mere compliance. It's, there are some good laws. They're not enough, but there are some good laws. And so number one is just respect the laws that do ex exist. Title IX, Title VII, um, many state laws. But don't stop with compliance. That can quickly become a checkbox situation where the, um, the underlying spirit of the law is disregarded in favor of sort of expediency. Number two, respond well. And that relates to the last section of this talk. It's a huge, um, a huge effect to respond well, respect the survivor's autonomy, um, use skills that encourage positive disclosure. Number three, bear witness, be accountable, and apologize. It's hard to do, but it's so, so effective and positive to um, when somebody t tells you about something, to, um, w when, to the extent you can do it, to apologize. It's not necessary that you were the perpetrator. You can still apologize if you have any reasonable role in, say, the institution. You can apologize on behalf of the institution. You can, um, you can certainly bear witness even if you don't have that role. 
We need to cherish whistleblowers. We really make a mistake in our institutions to punish whistleblowers. There are a few exceptions. Um, the software industry has figured out you can pay people to find bugs, and that's good. It's kind of whistleblowing. Um, but so far, I haven't seen anybody cherish whistleblowers of interpersonal violation or sexual violation. But it helps the institution to catch the problem early, right? So we can incentivize it. We could give people awards. Um, and we're so far from that. Um, another is we can systematize engaging in self-study. So in our institutions, we can actually on a regular basis get together and have conversations saying, are we committing institutional betrayal? We can assume people mean well and still might be engaging in institutional betrayal, which is what I assume. I mean, there are some bad actors, but most people aren't, and yet they're still engaging in institutional betrayal. So part of it is just being intentional, conscious, taking the time um, to, to ask those questions. Ask about the internal incentive structures. Are we rewarding coaches for winning or are we re rewarding coaches for creating a healthy environment for our student athletes? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, we can conduct anonymous surveys and um, we um, can survey all stakeholders. Um, these can be done in just about any organization that's got more than about 100 people. Um, you can protect an anonymity. Um, it helps to get researchers who know how to ask the questions, but there are a lot of resources available for free online. Um, and <coughs> um, share results and establish policy based on the data. We can make sure that our community, especially the leadership, is educated about sexual violence and related trauma. You know, I get hired a lot by, or they try to hire me, and I sometimes agree, by lawyers who are working on cases where their problem is not the lack of evidence, but the ignorance of people. So that they need me to go say, well, really, actually, it's, it's expected that a sexual assault dis dis um, survivor doesn't disclose, and um, you'd be passive, and so on. We, if we educated people, we would not be stuck in the problem we so often are, of people denying allegations just because they're ignorant about how sexual assault and memory and such things work. Transparency. Transparency is huge for any kind of fixing um, organizations or systems, but it's particularly huge around sexual assault. Sexual assault thrives in, the, in darkness. It thrives when things are covered up or hidden, and it really withers when there is attention drawn to it. So this, um, I leave to you to figure out wh how it would work in your institution. Um, but the, what we need to do is not just be addressing the problem within our own institution, but also be using our institutions to address the societal problem. So most organizations have some way they can contribute to the bigger, bigger issue. Obviously, universities are prime place because universities are tasked with generating and disseminating knowledge. And so universities should be doing much more of that on, on the topic of sexual violence and related kinds of betrayal traumas. But the film industry can stop making objectifying films and make films that actually, you know, portray healthy relationships and teach people about the nature of sexual assault. And I am sure that those of you who are here today would have lots of ideas about how you can use your organization to reach out to the broader community to, to help you addressing this problem. Knowledge and awareness are the antidotes to betrayal blindness. So that's good. I say that because I'm an educator probably, but I think it's really true. Um, and then finally, we need resources. I love this quote from Joe Biden who attributes it to his dad, I think. But don't tell me what you value. Show me your budget and I'll tell you what your value. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, my last thing I wanna do before taking questions is go through one story that makes me happy, so I hope it makes you happy. It's an example of where I saw institutional courage in action. Um, so this goes back to 1998, Brenda Tracy was um, a young woman and um, unfortunately um, she says she was um, assaulted by a group of men at a party 
and two of the accused assailants were football players. And this all occurred at Oregon State University, which is not my university. I'm at University of Oregon, but Oregon State's like in a very similar school about 45 miles away. Um, prosecutors led her to believe the case was weaker than it was. Rape kits were destroyed. The two football players had one game suspension and community service, and no one from Oregon State talked to Brenda Tracy. That was 1998. For 16 years, she coped with this horrible experience and did the best she could. She got a nursing degree, she had two kids, but she was suffering, but she's a strong person and did what she could to continue to live with this. 2014 rolls around and it becomes a topic of national discussion and the White House was talking about it and she was like, wait a minute, what happened to me? So she called up OSU to ask them, what happened to me? At first they blew her off, um, but she had access to somebody in the press, she told that person, a very beloved sports co um, columnist wrote a column about her, and it was published in the Oregonian, which is the main newspaper in Portland and the state of Oregon. Um, and this column, um, I am sure, was sent, many copies of, were probably sent to the president of OSU that morning. I can just imagine he opens his email and it's like, shh. Um, but he did something most university presidents don't seem to be able to do, which is he read it, and he responded to it in a non-defensive way. Now, he hadn't been president then, but that doesn't at all stop most university presidents from being defensive on behalf of their school. He actually ordered an investigation of the situation, and then he met with Brenda Tracy just three weeks later. None of these like take six months to investigate something, like did it, did it well. And then he wrote an apology letter, and I want to read a little of this apology letter. Dear Brenda, Oregon State officials are very grateful that you took the time to meet with us. We're so sorry for what you experienced in 1998 and have li lived with since. What we've learned recently of your suffering is heartbreaking and your bravery inspires us. We are also grateful to you for raising the public dialogue about the consequences of sexual violence in our society and for raising a discussion of how society can better assist survivors of such violence. While we cannot undo this nightmare, we apologize to you for any failure on Oregon State University's part to better assist you in 1998. I have spent my whole career in universities. I know that lawyers were all over this letter, and they were all over that sentence. So the sentence was worded very, very carefully. But you know what? The sincerity comes through. The, it, it, uh, the sincerity works, and it got, it was vetted by lawyers. I'm sure the president also said at some point, you're gonna have to let me say something. Um, but it, what t this says to me is the whole issue about liability is no excuse. This needle can be threaded. And he went on to say, as promised a few weeks ago, we conducted an exhaustive review of the fact of how OSU handled the matter 16 years ago. This review was completed this past Friday and we want to share the results of that review with you. After he apologized to Brenda Tracy, he hired her to be a consultant. Two years they worked together and they did many things together at the university, at, the, at Oregon State University. There we go. Sometimes it works too well. Okay, so um, this is what to me institutional courage can look like. Um, it involved investigation and transparency, apology, a partnership with Brenda Tracy. They ended up um, working at the state level to change some legislation. They created a new sexual assault resource center. They expanded a bunch of things on campus and they changed the atmosphere on campus. They, they made a difference in a, in a cultural sense on campus. Brenda Tracy is extraordinary. She's now going around the country working with other universities to try to bring about such changes and she particularly works with football teams and football coaches. So I, I end with the thought that we can all encourage institutional courage. Um, I do think ending sexual violence and harassment is a big job and it's gonna take some time. It's multi-generational. We have gotta get into families. It's not gonna happen overnight. But we can end institutional betrayal really relatively quickly. Institutions are made of grown-ups. We have resources. We can do it. We can end this and it's gonna be a crucial step in the right direction on stopping the sexual violation. So thank you very much. <laughs>
I would welcome your questions. Yes. And do you want people to at the microphone? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to ask you because you said earlier um, when you did the when you wanted to do the, sur the survey, they told you, "Oh no, we we can't have that." So um, you see that response. I don't know if that was your president at the time, but you fast forward to when you just opened with the anonymous survey, and they didn't want you to do it. That seems contradictory from an administrative institutional. A response, especially in light of what you just showed us in the letter and that yes. experience. So there were two different universities. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, Ed Ray is the president at Oregon State. Um, the president of my university at that time actually ended up um, resigning to spend time with his family two months later. <laughs> um, and so, um, yeah, I don't think he handled the situation well at all. But unfortunately, probably Ed Ray is the more unusual one than the one. And you know, I, I sort of breezed through that, um, that experience. Um, but what happened was that um, I, I did not need much support from the university in order to run a survey, because I have a lab and I know how to run surveys. I needed, I, what I, what the support, I, I didn't need their permission. What I needed was um, some payment to pay participants, um, and that's a methodological issue. I did not want people to do it just because they're interested in the topic. Um, and it, in my calculation, that was going to be about $20,000, because um, I want at least 1,000 people, $20 a person. And I also needed access to email addresses of students. And I found ways to get both of those things, despite the university saying no and so on. The university did, for a while, um, go after me. They told the press I had something called confirmation bias, which is a really bad thing to say about a scientist. Everybody actually has confirmation bias, it's a human thing, but you don't specifically say it about a senior scientist in your own university, so that wasn't cool. And they never actually took it back, which t totally amazes me that they've never taken it back. The, the, the president that replaced the re one who resigned um, told the press, when after I presented my survey results and the press had them all over the front pages, said, we are very lucky to have Jennifer Fry. That was the closest they came to an apology. <laughs> I would have liked an apology, you know, right. and I think the fact that it, there wasn't one, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's poison in the, and it lies there. Um, and I've seen that and experienced that a number of times. It's really hard to get that. Thank you. Uh, our, our commission has done a uh, survey of sexual harassment and misconduct and uh, with, uh, I think it's 10 years difference and we found that in our seminaries is where our largest uh, increase in those behaviors and I was wondering uh, from an institutional standpoint we have an accrediting agency would there be one or two things that you would su suggest that we would add to our checklist to kind of uh, uh, instill institutional courage yeah well of course I don't know all the all that you are doing um, so I don't know which of like those ten things I suggested you are doing, um, but um, it sounds like doing the surveys is is really important. I, um, are you working with researchers who? Um, and we, we have we have a researcher we're, we're working with, but I'm I'm just wondering if there's like if you were going to ask an institution to do maybe two or three things, mm -hmm. what would be one of those two or three th requirements that you would have them do internally to the institution? Yeah, it's hard to answer without having a lot of, I feel like okay. it's kind of a detail thing okay. to know, but um, I would just say all 10 of those things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. So because you did gender studies, I have a, or gender, Anyway, I have a question. So in your sexual harassment by faculty for graduate students, did you look at the male-female faculty and determine um, whether it was a both and or a one or the other who were perpetrators? In, in this, that particular study, we did not ask about the gender of the perpetrator. Um, in other studies we've done, we we've, we've have assessed gender perpetrator. And we tend to find um, in most domains of interpersonal violation that the pr primary perpetrators are male, especially when it's a sexual violation. 
but um, it's certainly not exclusively male. And you get every possible combination of genders. Right. Um, it's, just, it's just the probabilities, the numbers vary. And then, so my follow-up question, have you studied um, how the um, micro um, institution, so for example, your faculty group, who, are, who have sexual predators within their group, how that faculty group responds to sexual predators within the microorganism, for instance, within your own study group? Yeah, that, that's a really college. important question. I haven't studied it in the sense of like measuring it in a, lab, in a survey or laboratory study, um, but we have certainly seen, say, just in my own university, a big range in how um, certain departments respond to allegations right. of sexual violence. And um, I, I am pretty sure that's related then to, uh, to the probability there's more sexual violence in that unit. Um, we, we were able to see from the survey we collected a little bit about different rates for different units, and we found that the highest, at our campus, the highest rates of sexual violation we were picking up were occurring in the context of the law school. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't have a med school. And we don't have an engineering school, um, but we do have another, a, a number of other professional schools. The law school rates were so much higher on um, sexual harassment from faculty, staff, and peer on peer um, that it was statistically significant. Mm. And I've thought a lot about what that means. It was not something we expected, although the first time I presented the results was at a big conference of people working in um, trauma response, including a lot of different disciplines represented. And I asked people to guess where we would see the highest rate. And lots of people called out from the audience, law school, which I was like, wow, yeah, it was. Well, I hadn't known that, but apparently other people know that. Um, it is a little scary when you think about power in our country and, um, <laughs> and what this, you know, and I don't know why. I don't know what it's representing. Um, I did hear that the law school had a lot of discussion about our survey findings when they were published. <laughs> um, but I really wasn't there in the room. Um, where, where we you know, worry a lot is in departments where there's an ongoing, um, say, faculty perpetrator that, is, that everybody knows is doing yeah. that and they're not, they're not yeah, taking okay. action and stopping it. Yeah. yeah. One of the questions has already been answered. However, I was going to ask about engineering school. Uh -huh. um, so, and perhaps you don't have data as far as that is concerned. Uh, I don't. Um, I have spoken in groups where there are a lot of engineers present, and people have come and told me they feel like they're, they're um, especially women, have told me that you know it's just been pretty atrocious. Mm -hmm. um, the National Academy of Science has recently released a report on sexual harassment in the sciences, and I believe that they do have some data in that report on the rates um, experienced in different sciences and, and particularly in engineering. So as a follow-up, uh, you mentioned that uh, the factor of culture uh, was sometimes difficult, didn't reach significance because of the numbers in your experimental group. Yeah. Um, just offhand, uh, when you look at the um, California Pacific Conference, for example, that reaches um, many states, um, would a survey of that type um, have the numbers that would uh, result in a significant study? Yeah, I mean, Culture, I, I mean yeah. controlling for those factors. Yeah, I mean, I think what's important is that um, the, the sample be large enough yes. um, and diverse enough so that um, the, what we call in the field cell sizes, mm -hmm. the numbers within certain demographic categories are large enough that you can pick up an effect. And what we have at the University of Oregon, although 30% of people will identify as being other than white, they are so spread across different groups. And just looking at the data, I can see that um, ri risk um, almost surely varies n not simply as a matter of being not white, but which kind of not white one is. And yes. that really fits with the study I showed you from the Kauai, as well from Kauai, where being Japanese Hawaiian was um, lower risk and being Chinese Hawaiian was higher risk and Native Hawaiian was higher risk. And really, uh, this has to do, presumably, 
with power and status in the society. Yes, and the last part of this question, very quickly. Um, as far as institutional betrayal and how memory is affected, um, I don't know, I didn't see any studies. You're right, I didn't, you're right. <laughs> okay. So we do have one study, um, and what we found was, uh, um, and I apologize, I should have had that slide in there, but what we found was that um, for people who had experienced institutional betrayal and stayed in their institution, they had higher rates of what we call dissociation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so dissociation is um, spacing out, not remembering, um, it um, is, almost surely um, related to betrayal blindness. We don't know the causality there because we don't know if the higher rates of dissociation let people stay inside the institution despite the betrayal or the be institutional betrayal itself related, in some sense caused that. But, um, but yeah, no, we need to do a lot more on the particular issue of betrayal blindness. I should say research on betrayal blindness is really hard mm -hmm. because what we're trying to do is measure people's unawareness. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard. <laughs> one way, one you know, way we can do it is by saying, was there a period of time in the past when you did not remember something or were not fully aware of it? But for recent events, that's particularly difficult. Yeah. Thank you. I want to. Your turn. Okay, uh, <laughs> I was next in line, I guess. Uh, when we study multicultural uh, awareness and uh, person's understanding of privilege, very often, much like what I think you've presented here, is when persons um, have little experience of the event, they may not be aware of it. So you indicated that gender men more often did not experience betrayal, whereas women do. And then persons of, um, of different socioeconomic statuses that are not as privileged tend to have more incidents of um, trauma. <clears throat> Does that contribute possibly, much like multiculturalism, to awareness? And given, um, can you speak to uh, institutions like universities and conferences in the church? Uh, given that they're male and white persons uh, tend to be in places of leadership, is that part of the uphill battle? Yeah, yeah that, that's almost like a question I planted. <laughs> um, so first of all, we did research, um, I didn't tell you about where we asked about what characteristics of people lead them to believe or not believe an account, and um, gender's whopping. So if you read an account of sexual assault, on average, women are more likely to believe it than men. But interestingly, when we looked at um, within men, whether they themselves had experienced a sexual assault or betrayal trauma, the men who had looked like the women. The problem was that we've got men who have not had these experiences and um, are, are not able to empathize or believe people that have. So th this is, is really a, a very profound um, aspect of of our current situation. So, you know, obviously <laughs> having more uh, um, diversity, demographic diversity in leadership positions is going to directly, to some extent, go against that problem because you've got more people with their experiences as well. But the other piece of this is educational, finding ways to educate people who haven't necessarily had an experience <coughs> they can learn about it. I, I think one of the things that happens for women is even if they haven't been sexually assaulted, they all are aware of their friends who have, they know about it. Um, I, the first time I gave a talk in my own department about the rates of sexual assault among undergraduates, I actually had a professor tell me it can't be true because no student had ever told him about being sexually assaulted. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I'm an engineer and a survivor of assault, so that does happen. But I wanted to ask you this question. I'm, I'm thinking about this issue of memory, and I wanted to, I know you have your 10 um, items, your last slide, but could you list what would the top three um, things look like to create a culture so that when a woman or a man has this, has buried this for a long period of time, that they would be 
uh, it would be a culture where they might be able to bring that up again. What would be the top, what would be, what would we look like in the local church or in, I, I run a women's shelter? What would it look like to, to, to create that culture so that they could talk about it for yeah. the first time? Yeah, well, I mean, this might be the answer of a scientist, but I really actually believe that anonymous survey and publishing the data in a really transparent way so people understand they are not alone. I think having the, the, um, the barrier of feeling like you're the unusual one and the alone one is, is an enormous barrier. So the data, I think, open the door, make it a topic of discussion. So I would start with the, the well done anonymous survey. The next thing I would do is education because who wants to be um, talking to uneducated people about their experience? It's so awful when people then are asking you them, you know, well, why didn't you tell anyone kind of questions? If we educate people first, they're going to, the people that do come forward are going to be somewhat protected against those ignorant and harmful responses. And then, I mean, I, I, I just have to go back to apologizing. It's, it, it's so powerful. Apology. I, I gave you one story, but I've heard from other people about, I had one woman I, I um, interviewed she was in a child through, in the protective child thing, um, experience. Her case actually was prosecuted. Her father, who was her abuser, was actually sent to prison, but for a very short time. But mostly the case was messed up and things were, evidence was buried. And she, as a young child, was very traumatized by the prosecution. And she went to therapy for 30 years and struggled and um, accomplished things, but struggled. And then she got the idea of going back to the district attorney's office where this had all happened in a different state and um, trying to understand m more and talking to the current DA and describing the whole situation. And the DA wrote an apology letter on behalf of um, the, the messed up prosecution and all the ways she was harmed. She told me that one apology letter was so much more effective than 30 years of therapy. And, you know, I'm sorry, all of us in the mental health world, but really we won't have half the, the jobs we have if people would apologize in the first place. Humans make mistakes. Bad things happen. An apology can, you know, can take something bad and actually transform it into something positive. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for your presentation. We certainly learned a lot. Um, regarding the example you brought us at the last um, um, uh, at the end of your presentation, I was just wondering if uh, the school or the uh, the public authority was able to bring some kind of punitive justice to the perpetrators, and I'm just curious if or how much it is important for the institution to bring uh, punitive justice uh, to the perpetrators for their closure of the victims. Yeah. The justice question is so hard. I've been struggling with the justice question, and normally when I struggle with an intellectual thing, I um, offer a graduate seminar on the topic, <laughs> and I, I assign a lot of reading, and I hope and pray that my students will show me the way. <laughs> so I did that with the justice question, didn't work. All I walked away from it, and it wasn't any fault of the students, all I walked away from it was that I don't know what we're supposed to do once we have somebody who has committed one of these wrongdoings. Because, well, some people wish for that sort of punishment and, res and sort of retributive justice. Many other people don't. And in terms of preventing the problem from reoccurring, there's no indication right now that, that um, our, our current systems of justice are working. And while restorative justice might offer potential, it's got a whole host of challenges and difficulties for sexual violation in the first place. So I actually don't know. And, and someday maybe I will find out. I, I just say, well, I don't know what to do once we have, have you know, in, in a justice sense, we can heal as a community. But you know, in a justice sense, I don't know what we're supposed to do. And instead, my focus is on how do we make the world better so that in future generations, there'll be fewer of these justice challenges. Um, if one of you knows the answer, tell me afterwards. <laughs> I'm not sure who is next. Yes, you're over here. Um, you spoke earlier about the need to allow the victim to retain their story. It might be all they have left. Um, and I think that's certainly a valid concern. And 
the tension between that and the need for institutional integrity, um, you know, someone reports to, to us and, but wants to keep it uh, private. They don't want it to happen to someone else, want to take some step, but don't want, um, you want to keep it confidential versus our need to take some sort of, sort of action. Can you help, help me walk the line? Yeah, it's there. such a, it is truly a hard, a hard challenge. And there are, every case has to be looked at somewhat individually because there is a trade-off. There are times when the risk of imminent harm requires that we, we take action despite what somebody has requested. But the vast majority of times people are coming forward with some kind of sexual assault allegation it's, um, it's either old news or it's been going on for a long time. Um, and their process of coming forward has to be understood as part of a process that takes place over time. If the very first moment they tell somebody something is not the end of that process, it's just the very beginning. And if they're treated with proper respect, which means for their autonomy, and given enough time, there's a, a reasonably high probability they are going to get to the point where they want to pursue it in a more public way. And once they get to that point, then the institution can take the more external actions that might end, bring justice or end the ongoing abuse. If the, if the institution responds to that first disclosure, they're likely to harm the person who comes forward, chill other people from reporting because they see what that response is like. And not, um, and, and the person who comes forward may not even be willing to engage with the system either at that point. So as painful as it is to give people time when you've heard something you want to act on, it is the right thing to do most of, in most situations. Now, if somebody comes forward and says, you know, I, I was perpetrated um, as a child and I know this person is living with another child, that's a whole different thing because now you're dealing with with children and state legal, laws and legal requirements, right, right, and and maybe imminent threat to a new child. That's that you know that maybe you have to take action, or there's suicide or homicide or there are various things where you're going to have to take action. But most sexual assault allegations do not have those features, um, and in those cases, giving people time. I have a resource page that I um, on my website and have written a number of articles um, both in popular press and scholarly articles on what we call compelled disclo disclosure. So compelled disclosure is when there's a rule that you have to pass on somebody's information and, um, uh, and, and alternatives to that. And I was able to get instituted in my own university an alternative policy. We call it um, student where people are most employees are student directed. That is, the, they have to ask the student what the student wants the, to have happen with the information, follow that request, provide resources and supports. And uh, the students know that there are some people they would tell who would have to act on it and some people who would promise confidentiality. But most individuals at our university are going to be respectful of the students' wishes. It seems to be working really well. And I mean, we'll see down the road if we get more disclosures because of this more respectful stance that we're taking. Since this is a sexual ethics conference for um, the church, which is a different kind of institution, and since you have been working and doing great work, and thank you for it, in this uh, particular area that you've just presented today, and I'm, I'm gonna ask you to speak a little more personally about, I know tenure probably helps, but how you stay in the game. Um, you're right about the apology. I went back to work on my PhD at Emory in trauma studies and was a part of, you may know Carrie Ressler and Ann Schwartz and the work they did with uh, underreported uh, trauma histories um, associated with PTSD in an ur urban African-American patient population at Grady. I don't know if you know that, those work, that work, but it would, be, it would be useful to you to, to look at it for some of the non-white um, trauma histories. Uh, and PTSD rates. Um, but the, uh, the thing I want to ask, uh, because I was working after I did my PhD work in the Office of Community and Diversity at Emory and was in private practice as a therapist working at the time with a young undergraduate student who had been assaulted in a fraternity and choosing not to report immediately. Um, the uh, provost um, in, a, in a staff meeting whom I was doing, was, I was doing some ghostwriting for him, made a statement that if, if people didn't report 
rape or sexual harassment at that campus, his only conclusion was that it must not mean that much to, to that woman. So I, in confidence, couldn't convey what I was working with. Um, he, I ended up getting fired. I didn't have tenure. Got a ton of student loan debts. Constantly facing now my own uh, wrestling with not having health insurance and benefits. And uh, so this is really, <laughs> uh, this institutional power has been, has been more traumatic for me than the personal trauma I experienced that didn't, I didn't choose to expose. Mm -hmm. The insidious nature of institutional power is that a year and a half after I settled out of court, which didn't cover my student loan, I had to sign a non-disclosure, which I'm just now breaking, agreement. <laughs> the, the lawyers for Emory sent me a letter saying, we heard you had mentioned this settlement, and so you're now fined $20,000. So the fear, and then of course I hadn't done anything. Mm -hmm. So the fear that comes with trying to do right mm -hmm. and, and uh, by another person, who by the way came back five years later and thanked me, and she's now also She's a, she was a Latino student. She was the first one to go to college. And she was so ashamed of what happened to her. She didn't want to. She felt like it was a whole burden for her family. She exposed all this. So it was, you know, a heart, lot of heartbreaking. All I wanted, all she wanted was an apology. But she couldn't ask for the apology. But she came back to me years later and thanked me for keeping her confidence. She's now also a marriage and family, family therapist in another state. Yeah. But... Um, that you are making this point about the apology is huge. And so thank you for that work. And um, this institutional power is real. And what I'd like for you to speak to is how do you keep in this game? Because it is, I'm shaking. It's devastating for people who do this work yeah. and try to walk alongside other people, especially when it's institutional power. It's a, we've all witnessed this in this nation, you know, Whiteness is an institutional power. Right. And we've got to grapple with that if we're going to be a transformative institution in the world. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. You said a lot of really important and profound things. And also, I'm extremely sorry about what you described, both for you and the student. I mean, the truth is that it's really risky. Um, and, and in making, I, I really, you know, one of the reasons I am opposed to mandatory reporting is because I think it's coming a little bit from a mindset that it's the victim's job to stop the problem. Mm -hmm. And we should never put pressure on anyone to come forward or, um, you know, put pressure on the people that have experienced these horrible things to speak out. And yet, I think we also witness in our world that when they do, it can be transformative. And so it's like honoring the whistleblower, honoring the people that speak out without pressuring anyone else. Because when people do, they really, truly are risking things. I know lots of people who have lost their jobs over speaking out. I know professors who have been fired over speaking out or otherwise penalized and punished. And you know, in my own case, um, I have had a series of life experiences that have prepared me for this moment. So some of you are aware, but many of you may not be aware, that in the 1990s, I was the target of a national campaign, essentially. Um, and I was probably mentioned in just about every major newspaper in the United States in, in around 1992, nine, to about 1995. And that campaign was, um, was extremely challenging for me, and it related to not my speaking out in a public way, but by making a private disclosure, um, and it then becoming public without my, without my uh, permission. In the end, I ended up having to speak publicly, so you can imagine how much I you know, completely empathized with what Dr. Blasey Ford was going through, although her thing happened much more quickly and even more, obviously, publicly, but um, you know, I was, my story was everywhere, NPR, the New York Times, you name it. And um, somehow I got through that, and now nothing can really be like that. 
So in some sense, it's like this, you know, the concept of stronger in the broken place. And I think back, how did I get through that? Because for about three years, I was just, I, I already had tenure, so there was that. They couldn't fire me, but, um, but it, I was quite young, and um, I think I got through it by um, having an incredibly wonderful set of people around me. So um, I was, at the time um, that it started, I was the mother of two young children and in a very, very good relationship. Um, and one of the things that occurred during this time period is I got pregnant and um, gave birth to um, a third amazing child and really focused on that and kind of tried to keep my head down. Um, and my um, now late husband was exceedingly there with me as well as my friends. And somehow I got through that period and I just kept doing my work, kept doing my work. And um, as time has gone on, you know, there's still trickles of it, but it kind of has faded. So when some university administrator tells the press that I've got confirmation bias, you know, it really made me mad. But it's sort of like, you know, after what I went through, they, they're, they're not going to have that much effect. Um, that said, I also have a wonderful support network, and I'm sure none of these things are possible without that social support. Um, I, would, I don't want any of you to feel that I'm saying it's your job to speak out in a public way. Um, I, want, I hope you feel it's your job to make your institutions better places, but this speaking out in a public way is truly risky, and I am so grateful and thankful when people do, but there is really a risk you can get ostracized, you can get fired, you can you know, really get sued, really bad things, that Darvo thing <laughs> can happen to you. Um, and so don't do it unless you are you know, aware and in some sense willing to accept that risk, which I, I really appreciate what, that you just did. Yes, thank you for your work. It, it, and the presentation's been amazing. I was kind of wondering about the connection between an institution's resistance to apology and institutional betrayal. Well, I think they're super associated. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, in our institutional betrayal, um, well, we, well, actually, we have a new measure we're working on called the Institutional Courage. Um, questionnaire. Um, I have a graduate student, Alex Smith, he's doing his doctoral dissertation um, using this new measure we have been developing, and I'm pretty sure we have an item in there right about apology. So we will be able to answer your question with data in three months. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.